Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you revealed that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us worthy by the indwelling of your uh, worthy of the indwelling of your spirit, and make us worthy to celebrate this feast of lights, so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from heaven testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son who is worshipped, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted baptism from John his forerunner, and to the one Holy Spirit who descended and appeared above the head of the Son. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. The earth rejoice in your epiphany, O Son of God, and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You have dawned from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man and was worshipped, was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River, and cry out to him. Blessed are you, O Christ, the Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of a man. You gave us a pledge of life, and in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. Create a new heart within us and make us newborn children of your Father and pour out your forgiveness upon your flock that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to you, Holy Spirit, forever. Oh, 
O Christ, Word of the Heavenly Father, you became man for our sake and were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Kadishant aloho Kadishant Hayalato no Kadishant lo moho yuboto Mishiho detamed men yuhanon itracho Kadishat aloho Kadishat Hayalaton o Kadishat Lo moho yuhuto Mishiho detamed men yuhanon Itracham alain Sanctify our minds and purify our consciences, that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. have been truly blessed all on earth be attentive waters have been sanctified from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, now I myself, Paul, urge you through the gentleness and clemency of Christ I who humble when face to face with you, but brave toward you when absent. I beg you that when present, I may not have to be brave with that confidence with which I intend to act boldly against someone who consider us as acting according to the flesh. For although we are in the flesh, we do not battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our battle are not flesh, but are enormously powerful, capable of destroying fortresses. We destroy arguments and every pretension, raising itself against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. And we are ready to punish every disobedience once your obedience is complete. Look at what confronts you. Whoever is confident of belonging to Christ should consider that he belongs to Christ. So do we. 
And even if I should boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not tearing you down, I shall not be put to shame. May I not be as one frightening through you, to letter, through you letters. For someone will say, his letters are severe and forceful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Such a person must understand that what we are in word through letters when absent, that we are also in action when present. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. You may silent to listen. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Apostle John writes, The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one of whom I said, A man is coming after me, who ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. I did not know him, but the reason why I came baptizing with water was that he might be made known to Israel. John testified further, saying, I saw the Spirit come down like a dove from the sky and remain upon him. I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, On whomever you see the Spirit come down and hover, he is the one who shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now I have seen and I have testified that he is the Son of God. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and praise to Jesus Christ, the Lord and God, for giving us his words of life. Praise and praise to Jesus Christ, For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but they have power to destroy strongholds. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is chapter 10 of St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And I'm sorry you don't have it written in your bulletins, and there's no bulletins this week because I was on retreat with the other priests this week. But this chapter 10 in the second letter to the Corinthians. What St. Paul is doing between this and the end of the letter, these last three chapters, 10 through 13, 
is he's dealing with that contentiousness going on within the church at Corinth. Whenever we have human assemblies, whenever there's a group of people together, there's always issues. That's just the way we do things. But of course, the, it, the majority of the people in Corinth, we can tell from the letters, are doing fine. They're working and trying to walk in the path of the gospel. But there's a minority there, and there's a significant minority, either because they're a large group of them, still a minority, but a large number, or they're just vociferous, which often things happen that way also in human life. So what St. Paul is doing at the end of this letter, and it could be a letter by itself, it makes a unit by itself, it's a defense of his apostolate of what he's been accomplishing or trying to accomplish in Corinth. And as I said, it forms a unity to itself. And what's happening here is there are people who are saying, well, look, who's this guy anyway? When he's away from us, he writes us these tough letters. And then when he comes among us, he barely talks, he's not much of anything, he's even timid. And when he preaches, bah, contemptible, no good. But these men, these are really good apostles, referring to, we have no idea who they are, but who presented themselves as bringing the gospel, but contradicting St. Paul, doubtless coming from Jerusalem. This is not someone like Apollos. Apollos is from Alexandria. Apollos was working with St. Paul and was in Corinth. And there were people in St. Paul that thought he was, as we say today, awesome. Good Greek, smooth, eloquent, they loved it. And they grouped around him. This is the guy we like. Paul, you know, not very good Greek. You know. But there wasn't a problem there because Apollos was not presenting himself with a different message. So St. Paul doesn't really care about personalities. What he's concerned about are these men who present themselves, and he uses the term super apostles, the ones who really know what's going on in Jerusalem, who are misleading the people in Corinth. But for whatever human talents they have, they're misleading the people in this parish. So St. Paul takes the whole last part of this letter to deal with this. That's why it sounds strange when we first hear this reading, but St. Paul is then going to present and give arguments of what's going on. And the thing that he's pointing out is you cannot judge merely by the externals. He doesn't try to defend his preaching or his teaching. He doesn't try to defend the way he's giving it. No one's perfect. There's always going to be failures of aspects of our lives. So he's not saying that I am a great preacher. He's saying my message is the one that is true. And regardless of the packaging from the super apostles, they are wrong. And you're being misled superficially because you're judging only the outward. And you're not judging what is actually taking place. Which is why I began with that quotation, which is from actually verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare, and he presents the gospel. This is a conflict between light and darkness, between heaven and hell, between God and Shaitan, the adversary. This is not just simply a walk in the park that makes us feel good on occasion. This is combat. And he says our weapons in this warfare are not of this world. You can't see them and perceive empirically the spirit of God. That's what's bringing about the misunderstanding and the misjudgments. He says, but the war, this, this weapons that we have are not of this world, but they have the power to destroy song, strongholds. Now, we all have the advantage of 2,000 years of history. We know what the gospel has done in the world and how it has transformed civilization. It has given us a calendar, transformed time, and is still at this moment the largest, the largest religion functioning on the planet. St. Paul writing this in the first generation, in the first years, when there's a couple hundred people here and a few hundred people there, and another few hundred people perhaps over there around the Mediterranean basin, and he's saying the weapons that we hold destroy fortresses, Okay, not only is he not a good preacher, and not only is he not much of a presence personally when he's here, 
He's nuts. But he's saying that you have to understand that the spirit of God's work is something which, though it's not perceivable, is something which is taking place among you now. Now, during this week, one of the things we did on the retreat is we, we, we delved into our Syriac writers. And one of them is Simon Taibute. Simon, literally, his grace. Simon wrote in his, his seventh century writer, when he wrote, his great impact, his great insistence was the material things, our lives, the circumstances, that these things have to be seen, not in their materiality, but of the creative force behind them, of God who works through everything. And hence, the subriquet, the nickname that he received, his grace, because he's always talking about God's grace. Everything comes through the hand of God. And that is an, an idea which is exactly opposite of the people in Corinth who are saying, this, this, and this is what we don't like about this man, Paul. So what St. Paul, when he writes in, in verse three, is although we are in the flesh, we do not battle according to the flesh. And then he goes on to talk about the weapons that we have in this combat. So that what's taking place is a lack of vision. And this is the insistence on Simon also in his writings is that of the, what is called in the Greek theoria. Our word theory comes from it, but it actually means um, a regard, a contemplative regard, a long regard, not just seeing something, but a pondering or looking upon something. And he's saying that's what we have to develop within the gospel by this grace, by the Spirit of God, in order to be liberated. Otherwise, we're always going to be shackled to the things of this world. Our primary concern is going to be this world because we don't have the vision above, which is transformed by grace. And St. Paul is telling the people in Corinth the problem that you have, and it's understandable to some extent, is that you're trying to make judgments about things that you don't actually even see. Because quite honestly, the Spirit of God and God himself, these are not things that we hear. These are not things that we touch. It's not visible. And because of that lack of empirical evidence for the Spirit at work and within the life specifically of St. Paul, this becomes the source of misunderstanding and the source of what ultimately is their judgmental attitude, which is causing this problem within the parish. So what St. Paul is insisting upon is that the Spirit is at work in the doctrine that I'm giving you, in the lineage that I'm giving you, in the connection with the power of the resurrection. Because the work that takes place through the apostolate, through the priesthood, is not administration, making sure bills are paid. That is not why the priest exists. The apostolate is here because it is meant to illuminate and to perfect in the terms of Pseudo Dionysius, another Syrian writer of the sixth century, of the fifth century, in fact. In there, he talks about the fact that what God is always accomplishing by his grace and by this illumination is to instruct and to edify. Edify literally means in Latin to build something up. And he's saying that what is being given then through this apostle of St. Paul is the illumination. That's primarily the work through the mysteries and through the teaching, through catechesis, and then perfection. And that's the aspect of the episcopacy, the apostolic, the apostolic life in its fullness, because it's able to propagate. There's very little distinction between the priest and the bishop, except that the bishop ordains other priests and extends and perfects this work. But otherwise, the priesthood as such is the illumination and of the preparation and the transformation by the mysteries. And St. Paul is saying, you can't see that. You can't see even for our individuals. We don't necessarily know ourselves very well. And as life goes on and experiences slam us around, we learn a bit more about who we are and the way we react to things. But even if our own human heart escapes us in its invisibility, how much more the work of God himself around us. And so St. Paul is just saying, Cool your jets. Don't judge. 
by only things that appear to you and which, of course, you're judging only because they're pleasant to you. The way the preaching, talking about his speech being contemptible, or that he's kind of a hypocrite because when he writes letters, he's tough. But when he's with us, he's really timid, in fact. He's saying, no, I write these letters so that if I write with the sternness within the letter, I don't have to be stern when I'm with you. We can just enjoy the coffee. And so he's trying to bring the Corinthians, these, this group, again, it's a minority, but this group back to understand the work that God is accomplishing, not because this is Paul or any other man who's been consecrated within this work, because it's God, it's God fundamentally who's doing this, which is why he has this beautiful phrase in verse five, following after about the weapons of our warfare. He says, we destroy arguments and we destroy every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God, to that illumination. That's the work that we do. Not here to entertain, not here to do anything else, not here even to pay the bills, but to bring this illumination and therefore to shatter the obstacles and the arguments that stand in the way, one of them being this misjudgment about the person of Paul. And he says, why do we do this? We destroy, we have destroyed arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and we take every thought, every human thought captive to the hearing, to the obedience of Christ. It's a beautiful phrase. Why is he concerned about this cliquishness in Corinth? It's not because of cliquishness or his feelings are hurt. It's because you're allowing yourself to be blinded by your human, way too human understanding of things. But we're here in order to break down those human arguments, in order to tear down the obstacles that stand in the way of the mind, the spirit, and the heart of being transformed within the hearing of the gospel of Christ. It's a very beautiful image. And because that is the reality, the Western world was transformed over the last 2,000 years. Because that obedience, that hearing, and that captivity to goodness took place among so many millions of people. And when it takes place within our lives individually, that beauty and goodness also becomes manifest, not just in me, but to the people that even have contact with me. So at first it sounds like he's just fighting back, but he's saying, look, we're arguing over things which are actually quite unimportant. And what we're here to do is to bring us into this illumination of the Spirit of God. So I want to leave you with the example of the saint today. Today we commemorate Saint Jacob of Nisibis, Mar, Jacob, Nisibina. And Saint James, also known as James and Jane, Jacob are the same name. Saint Jacob of Nisibis was bishop from 303 or 308 to 338 in Nisibis. He's second bishop in Nisibis. And I'm almost probably none of us have heard of who this man was. But what he did in Nisibis is he founded not only his apostolate of administration, but he founded the school of Nisibis, which again, nobody really probably even knows about. But within that school, he established as a teacher, Malfono. He established a man whom you do know as Mar Ephraim, Saint Ephraim whose poetry and theological writings have influenced to a tremendous extent, fundamentally, the Syriac tradition. But he is a student of Saint Jacob of Nisibis. This is the man who made him teacher within the school. This is the man who made him deacon, ordained him to the diaconate. We know Saint Ephraim as Saint Ephraim of Edessa. Edessa is west, west of Nisibis. Because in this constant wars in the Mesopotamia, which we continue to this 21st century, back and forth, fighting over who gets what between these two rivers. So they were doing in the time of St. James between Rome and Persia, back and forth. And when the Romans lost Nisibis, part of the military, part of the treaty, the war treaty, was that the Christians in Nisibis would be allowed safe passage 
to leave so they wouldn't be under the pagan government or suffer persecution, and which the Persians granted. This is the reason why St. Ephraim leaves Nisibis, Persia, and goes to Edessa. He actually only spends 10 years, the last 10 years of his life, in Edessa. But this is the influence of one man upon one other man who has influenced millions of us since then. This is an extraordinary understanding of how this works. Through our lives and through our colleagues, our friends, this transformation that we ask the intercession of Mar Yaqub, that he obtain for us that docility to come to the illumination that the mind and our thoughts be brought captive, as St. Paul says, into the obedience of Christ. And that through the intercession of St. Jacob and through St. Ephraim, we may come to this understanding of grace, which works through all the things that are around us, specifically within the mysteries, of course, but God is always at work within our lives. So that St. Paul finishes in this letter by saying, or this section that we have quoted today, these people who don't understand, these people who are upset, these people who are complaining over coffee and donuts or over the phone or whatever, he says they don't understand. And he says such a person must understand that what we are in word through letters, what I write to you in letters, I am when I'm with you. But I write this way so that when I'm there, that action doesn't have to be as severe as we mentioned. So such a person must understand that what we are in word, through letters, when we're absent from you, that we also are in action when we're present. There's no difference, there's no hypocrisy, there's no duplicity, it's always the same. So let us enter into the light through the intercession of St. James and St. Ephraim and come into that beauty of the illumination on this great epiphany. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father from all ages, God from God, light from light, true God and true God, begotten. Church. We confess one baptism. 
forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Yitelvot madeb heida locho, walvot alocho dam chadeh. Reinem suvot aino toho cheul al baitok veskudet. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Jacob. Remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen. Son and to the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. 
May we, who have remained in your divine love, be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with all the kids. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people and through your Holy Spirit now and forever. bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you, and with purity and holiness we, and with purity and holiness may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we lift them up to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility it is right and just Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are come, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. 
He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only Son. In Sabe Lahma Bida Kari Shoto, O Bada Hukade, Waksoya Bertarimita Kado Mara, Saba Hula Mene Hulho, O no Denita Fahro Ti. Bar <laughs> Khusayan hame wa khaye dal alam alamin Do this in memory of me Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup You remember my death until I come again comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured who can praise your plan of salvation for us we can only ask of you a lover of all people that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of all our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you and through you and with you he implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God. Have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. 
Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Nite Mother Rojo Hayu Kadisho, Unachena Lainu Alu Kodabono Hono. This bread, the body of Christ our God, be for us a pledge of life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of life. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults and forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Nisrala Peter, our retired Patriarch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the venerable priests, the chaste deacons, the pure subdeacons, and all the orders of the church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice, strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who please you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. O Lord, have all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. And rest from God to the departed, and forgive sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O oh Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray. 
so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, earth as it Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us. That your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar and before the body and blood of our Savior who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. 
Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. <clears throat> o God the Father, we bow before you and entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the Holy Cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.